Good evening, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And this evening, we'll talk about um, Anthony Fauci, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who was America's or deemed to be America's preeminent doctor. And he was head of the NIAID. Am I saying that right? And the NIH, right? That was Dr. Fauci's position former position because he's now retired, having been at the helm of the scientific industry for many years. And Dr. Fauci, during the pandemic, touted himself as the science, that he represents the science. Even though he has on many occasions uh, defended this sort of statement um, to suggest that when he says that he represents the science and he is the quintessential scientist, it means that he um, follows the science as best as the evidence um, is brought forward. Now, this is very important that we understand who Dr. Fauci is, because Dr. Fauci is Jesuit educated and Jesuit trained. And for those of you who are not familiar with the purpose and the function of the Jes Jesuits, you know, it's very important that you do your research. But they were founded, it was a religious organization that was founded by um, Loyal, what's his name again? The Spanish priest. Um, I forgot his name already. Loyola, right? Um, let me see. I have forgotten his name, and I, it's always on my tongue. I'm now forgetting what his name was, right? But this Spanish um, soldier, he was actually yes, Ignatius de Loyola, right? But Ignatius de Loyola. He was the founder of the Jesuit organization, the Jesuit order. And they were particularly founded to uh, counter the efforts of the Protestant Reformation. Remember now that in 1517, when the Protestant Reformation came about, you had, you know, Europe was in flux in terms of a war because at the time, the Catholic church was a church that dominated the political scene. And what happened is that the, these Christians, right, these Protestants, they talked about the fact that it was not the right thing for the church to be ruling the state, right? Because you talk about the woman riding the beast. And when we have that symbol in Revelation of the woman riding the beast, it means therefore that a church, a fallen church, is actually dictating to the government what uh, the government should do and should not do. And that was a persecutory power, right? The Roman Catholic papacy was a persecutory power. Now, this military um, gentleman called Ignatius de La Loyola, who was a, um, a, 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 a soldier, right? Uh, he was in the army, a Spanish soldier. He wanted to show allegiance to the Roman Catholic Church, and he promised the church, the papacy, the Vatican, that he would form this Jesuit society, this Jesuit order, so that they that would counter whatever Protestant um, reformation and revolution that was happening in Europe at the time. Now, this is a former Jesuit um, priest. I'm going to read to you what he's saying about the Jesuits, right? Um, Aldera, um, this is Dr. Rivera's, right? I think he was Alberto Rivera, and he was a former Jesuit priest. Now, let me just share the screen with you to let you see what Professor Rivera, all right, that Dr. Rivera was saying about the Jesuits, just to give you a synopsis. Now, this book is The History of the Jesuits, and it says here, the early fathers observed most of the ancient Babylonian system plus Jewish theology and Greek philosophy. So he's referring to the early fathers of the Catholic Church. They all perverted most of the teachings of Christ and his apostles. They paved the way for the Roman Catholic machine that was to come into existence. Piously, they attacked, perverted, attacked, and added to, and took away from the Bible. So this was what the Roman Catholic Church sought to have done, right? That they, um, they mixed, they merged Babylonian philosophies with Greek philosophy, which of course had nothing to do with the Bible, along with Jewish theology. We all know that the Jews eventually 
did not recognize Christ as Lord and Savior, right? And that was something that led to their downfall as a nation. Israel as a nation, they actually um, were destroyed. Well, because, yes, they were destroyed in AD 70 when their temple was actually um, annihilated by the Romans, by the Roman Empire. Now, the fact of the matter is that they, because they rejected Christ, it led to the downfall of that chosen people because Christ has chosen them as his nation, as his people. But because of their rejection of God's son, Christ Jesus, our Lord, they were actually um, destroyed. When I say destroyed now, they were not, they are still existing as, as a nation, but they are no longer God's chosen people. So they paved the way for Roman Catholic machine that was to come into existence. Piously, they attacked, perverted, added to, and took away from the Bible. This religious antichrist spirit working through them is seen again when Ignatius de Loyola, right? Loyola is now the Spanish soldier who started the Jesuit order, created the Jesuits to secretly accomplish two major goals for the Roman Catholic institution. And they have two major roles. The Jesuit order has two major roles and that these two roles are one, universal political power. So they are seeking political power and it has to be universal, which means world power. And number two, a universal church in fulfillment of the prophecies of Revelation 6, 13, 17 and 18. Right, so that in a nutshell tells you what the Jesuit order is about. Um, let us read here just before we go. By the time Ignatius de Loyola arrived on the scene, the Protestant Reformation had seriously damaged the Roman Catholic system. Ignatius de Loyola came to the conclusion that the only way his church could survive was by enforcing the canons and doctrines on the temporal power of the Pope and the Roman Catholic institution, not by destroying the physical life of the people alone as the Dominican priests were doing through the um, Inquisition, but by infiltration and penetration into every sector of life, right? So the, while the Catholic Church had this strategy of killing people if they were not acquiescing, right, if they were not, you know, acceding, assenting to their religious beliefs, you know, because that was what the Dominican order did. You would just be persecuted, burned at the stake, right? And you would be tortured. Whatever thing they could do to get rid of you, they would do it to, to banish you from the face of this world. They would institute those sort of um, activities, right? However, the Jesuits say that they, you know what, we're going to change our strategy. The Jesuit order says we are going to change our strategy of just killing and murdering and maiming and torturing Christians. We'll just infiltrate their organizations, right? And they won't know. And every sector of your life, the Jesuits control. So they're not just in religion. And many people, when they hear about the Jesuits, they think about just some nice people, you know, wearing some nice white gowns and they're, you know, trying to feed the poor. And that is not what this organization is all about. And that's why you have to read. You have to delve into these things and don't allow people to say, oh, it's just conspiracy theories, right? These are factual information, historical information that you need to be aware of, or you are going to be deceived. Because as the writer is suggesting here, and Alberto Rivera was himself a Jesuit priest who eventually renounced even though they say that you can't renounce the faith. One's a Jesuit, always a Jesuit. You know, but you know, you leave a man's heart up to God. And he did reveal before his death, and he had an untimely death, um, the some of the agendas of the, the Jesuit uh, order. Now, Dr. Fauci is an interesting Jesuit. He's also Jesuit trained. As we said, they are in every sphere of life, whether they're teachers, educators, professors, scientists, politicians, jurists, lawyers, they are in all professions in the world. Now, this is an article that was written um, by this Catholic organization. So you're not going to tell me now that I am talking conspiracy because this is, uh, you know, very credible, as it were, Catholic publication. America, the Jesuit Review. That's in, that's the title of this publication. Let me share my screen with you so that you can see what I'm reading from. 
and you can also do your own research. I'll attach it below the description box. So we have here Jesuit educated Dr. Anthony Fauci to teach at Georgetown University. By the way, Georgetown University is the preeminent Jesuit institution in the United States, the preeminent academic right? Jesuit institution in the United States of America. Now, um, you know, it's in Washington, D.C. So the, the article says here, Dr. Anthony Fauci is headed back to school with the Jesuits. So that means that he had already been there with them, right? Because he is, in fact, Jesuit educated. And there are lots of information online if you need to go there and research where he went to school, right? And his Jesuit training and indoctrination. Georgetown University announced Monday that it has appointed Dr. Fauci, the distinguished university professor in the School of Medicine's Department of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases. And by the way, this article was written on June the 26, 2023. So I gather that he is still there as a distinguished fellow, distinguished professor at this eminent university in the United States. Calling him a dedicated public servant, Georgetown University President John J. De Gloria said in a statement that Dr. Fauci has embodied the Jesuit value of being in service to others throughout his career. And we are grateful to have his ex expertise, strong leadership, and commitment to guiding the next generation of leaders to meet the pressing issues of our time. The appointment begins July 1, and he will to he will hold an additional role at the Moncourt School of Public Policy. The press release notes that the rank of university professor is the university's highest professional honor that recognizes its extraordinary achievement in scholarship, teaching, and service. Right? So this is not coming from me. He said Dr. Fauci became a household name during the early days of the coronavirus pandemic, advising two presidents over the course of the public health emergency and serving as a constant source in the media about precautions Americans could take to protect themselves. Later, he became a target of anti-vaccine activists who spread misinformation about his career and affiliations and critics of public health uh, provisions that they were to strict. So this is what is coming from a Jesuit publication, a U.S. Jesuit publication. And of course, they're heaping praises on Dr. Fauci. Now, recently, Dr. Fauci had an inquiry, as it were, um, in, in the House of Representatives, I think in Congress. And, you know, the Republicans, it seemed to have grilled him. Well, some people think that they were also easy on him. There are lots of other things that they could have grilled him about and they could have asked tougher questions and they went you know, easy on him. Um, Taylor Green perhaps did not. She was very um, much forthright with him. In fact, she said that she would not want to call him. She was not desirous of calling him a doctor anymore. She thinks that his medical license should be revoked, right? And that he should no longer be called the doctor. I leave that up to you. But the fact of the matter is that Dr. Fauci was at the helm, as the Jesuit publication suggested, of the pandemic, um, you know, committee, you know. And the fact of the matter is that he was the one who gave a lot of the recommendations and the advice to scientists, not only in the United States, but around the world. Now, one of the, the, the things about the Jesuits and Dr. Fauci in particular is that they are known to be double-tongued, right? And they speak, you know, they have many faces and they can control both sides of the discourse. So you sometimes don't know which side they're taking, right? Because they believe in the the, the, the thesis and the, anti, um, the antithesis. And they think that when you merge both of these, the thesis and the antithesis, or the antithesis, then that is going to produce a synthesis of what they want, right? So that is what. So you could have, for example, the Republicans and the Democrats, and you could have Jesuits on both sides, because as we suggested, they have infiltrated all spheres or sectors of our lives. There's nothing that we do, no institution that perhaps does not have a Jesuit right there. And their main purpose, we talked about it, was the universal political power. They were seeking two things, 
universal political power and universal religious or church power. And we, if you read Revelation, you know, 6 and 13 and 17 and 18, as the former Jesuit priest Alberto Rivera suggested, you'll find that this is the woman riding the beast. And the Bible did suggest that the uh that a woman symbolizes a right church, so a good woman, right? A righteous woman symbolizes the church of God, right? A righteous church, while you have the a prostitute. A harlot, the Bible talks about the harlot riding the beast, symbolizes a fallen church, a church that has adulterated the word of God with the philosophies of men. And that is why he was talking about, that's Albert Rivera, he was talking about the Jesuits and the Catholic Church merging Babylonian teachings with Greek philosophies with Jewish theology, right? Because they were actually putting together and adulterating the Bible with these philosophies. We have to be careful. For example, a lot of teachings in our universities are that sort of mixing, even in our theological seminaries, right? You have a lot of pastors coming out and their philosophies are in fact Jesuit influenced, right? We have to understand that a lot of the interpretations coming from the Bible about the Bible are also Jesuit influenced. We have to understand the history of the Jesuits if we're to see how they play out, how they act in the world and how they influence, right, the world to a great degree, not only in the religious sphere, but also in every sphere of our lives, in the political realm, in the scientific realm, everything, right, is stained by the Jesuits. So Anthony Fauci had an interesting drilling, as it were, in the House of Representatives, and the Republicans were on top of him, and they were suggesting that you know he was responsible. He he had he, he his uh, you know his um supervision right um over the pandemic was catastrophic right, and that he was responsible, as it were. Some people were suggesting for the deaths of many people because of the advice that he gave to the public. Now, I can't say a lot of things about Dr. Fauci on this platform, so I hope that you'll understand, but I hope that you will also do your research on Dr. Fauci's connection with the Jesuits. And if you understand that, you then I would not have to really delve into who Dr. Fauci really is. But if you understand who the Jesuits are and their historic and even present day, how they function, you will understand that whatever Dr. Fauci was doing was nothing that was contrary to Jesuit teachings and philosophies. In fact, when I, when the pandemic started and I looked at him and that he was the main actor, he was the grand master, he was the science, you know, and I read of his Jesuit training and education, I knew that that was it for me, that I was done as far as that was concerned, because it's, I just have to look at one name and you see the Jesuits. And once you see that, you know that you need to walk the other way because <laughs> I don't think that they are going to be doing anything that is going to be Christ-centered to say the least, right? And that is something that you have to understand. Now, if the AP here had a piece of news about Dr. Fauci's drilling. And uh, let me see if I could share my screen with you so that you could see what I am reading from. It says here that Fauci pushes back partisan attacks in fiery house caring over COVID origins and controversies, right? And Dr. Fauci, the top US infectious disease expert until leaving the government in 2022, was back before Congress on Monday calling simply preposterous Republican allegations that he'd tried to cover up origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. A GOP-led uh, subcommittee has spent over a year probing the nation's response to the pandemic and whether U.S.-funded research in China may have played any role in how it started, yet found no evidence linking Fauci to wrongdoing. Now, it's interesting that they're saying that they found no evidence when he was the one who sent the money. It's, it's, you know, the evidence is there that he was the one who was responsible because he, sits up, he sat atop of a huge amount of 
money, right? He'd already been grilled behind closed doors for 14 hours over two days in January, but Monday, Fauci testified voluntary or voluntarily in public and on camera at a hearing that quickly deteriorated into partisan attacks. So Republicans repeated unproven accusations against the longtime National Institutes of Health scientists, while Democrats apologized for Congress, besmirching his name and bemoaned a missed opportunity to prepare for the next scary outbreak, right? The next scary outbreak. Are they telling us something that we don't know? I leave you to decide that, right? But one of the things that is very interesting is how the Republicans, yes, were the ones who were actually grilling him or pretended to be doing so while the Democrats were, were heaping praises, right? And encomiums on Dr. Fauci and pretending as if he were a hero and that he was beyond an inquiry, right? That the, it was not the nation's um, representatives, political representatives, to question really what, to, what happened during the pandemic and how Dr. Fauci might have played a role, whether positive or negative, in that pandemic. So it's very interesting that we begin to look closely at some of these leaders and see you know, what organizations they are affiliated with and how said organizations or institutions might should I say now, constrict, restrict, and uh, destroy some of the civil liberties that we hold so dear. Got to really uh, study these characters, right? Because it's very important that we understand that. But we can't just, you know, detach people from organizations, right? You know, I am a Christian, I am a Seventh-day Adventist, and then that is my philosophy. You are going to have to study the history of the Seventh-day Adventist movement and its teachings and to see if I'm going to lead you, what sort of philosophy, right, that guides um, my sort of worldview and perspective. So this is what is I had to say, hope that you have learned something from it, um, because at the end of the day, we are, uh, we are responsible for our knowledge, and we're also responsible for the decisions that we make in life. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you will like and you will share and you will subscribe because at the end of the day, we are the thinking channel and we will we are desirous of exposing as to you, exposing the world um, to as much information as possible. See you then. Hope that you have a fantastic evening.